The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, guys, to our February Ask a Therapist. My name is Megan Meisler, and I am the Executive Director at Lutheran Counseling Services. LCS is a safe place to share and change your story, and so we are hosting these webinars once, once a month about different topics that we're focusing on this month. And for the month of February, we are talking about inclusion. It's been um, it's been our I Am Stronger week that Erica will share about that we do every year here at LCS. And so we want to talk with you about families, kids, and relationships. So we're excited that you have joined us. Um, I'm going to introduce Erica Sickles to you in a couple minutes, but I just want to tell you about our format today. So we're trying out this new screen or this new camera. So stay with us if we kind of like bobble back and forth. It's called a meeting owl and we're just getting used to it. Um, but on our webinar today, we want to encourage you to ask questions, share comments. Um, we do know that there is a bit of a delay. Um, so as you um, type something in on that right sidebar on your computer, just give us a couple minutes to notice it and we will definitely respond to your questions and comments today as we talk about inclusions um, inclusion of our children, inclusion in families, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, just how to check in with each other and sharing resources to help strengthen your families and strengthen your relationships. So as we get started, I want to introduce to you Erica Sickles. Um, she is a registered mental health intern um, with us, and she runs our school counseling program. So will you tell us just a little bit about you as we get started here today? Okay. Well, I get to have the distinct honor and blessing of running our school counseling program, and that is something that's really near and dear to our heart, to my heart. Um, and it's something that I'm, I'm really proud of. One of the things we do is we have mental health counselors or registered, um, those of us who are registered to work towards our license, we go into the schools and we're able to work with kids where they are in their environment with teachers with their administrators parents can stop by and um, so that's something that's really important to me and something that um, brings us to what we're doing here today and one of the things we've been focusing on each month in the schools we take a particular trait that we hope to build in kids and build in families that really helps promote mental health and so like Megan said, inclusion is the topic that we're focusing on this particular month. And for me personally, I remember there were a lot of times as a child that I did not feel included and it actually led me into this profession. And so that's something also that's very near and dear to my heart um, and something that I really hope to instill feelings of inclusion across all the campuses we serve and across all the families that are able to join us here today on this webinar. Okay, so like I said, I'm playing with this camera. And it's a little, ah, a little <laughs> funky. So maybe you can see that. Maybe you can't. But um, so I want to get started. Um, we kind of have a PowerPoint to kind of structure our time together because Erica and I want to share. Both have things that we want to share with you today. Um, but just, just so I know it's working. If you are on and you want to type in the chat. Um, section on the right hand side. Would you just share your name with us and how many people live in your house? Um, and then we know one, we know that it's working and two, we know who's joining us today. Um, so really quickly, I'll just share. Um, my name is Megan Niesler. Like I said, I am married to my husband, Matt, and we have three children. Um, they are seven. Oh my goodness. 11 and 12. So I have a boy and two girls. Erica, who lives in your house? So I live with my husband and then we have a daughter who just turned eight. I'm getting used to that um, this week. And then I have two stepdaughters that live with us quite a bit, um, about half the time. One is 16 and one is off at college and just turned 19, but luckily local and gets to come by. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Let's see if I can get this thing to like do its own thing. Maybe. We'll see. Okay. Thanks for hanging in there with us. So we're going to get started. Like I said, if you could type in your name in the side section and share with us who lives in your house. And I'm going to go ahead and share our PowerPoint as we get up and going today. Um, give me a hot second here. Okay. Hopefully we can get this going. Perfect. So as we said, this is Ask a Therapist, uh, our February edition, Inclusion and Families. And there are our credentials if you're wanting to know. We're going to share some pictures with you too. So we've just 
work to cite everybody that we use as resources. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit, Erica, about the school counseling program, but specifically about the I Am Stronger week that we just had. Yeah, so like I said, the school counseling program allows us to have mental health counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists in the schools and really working with kids, making it easier and accessible for our families. Um, the schools that join and partner with us pay for that service, which is another nice opportunity because the families who use the service at the schools um, don't have to pay for our service. The school has already made mental health a priority for their school by bringing us there in partnership. And so depending on the school and the needs, we're there um, half a day up to maybe three days and working with children, families in small groups um, and individually as well. And so like I said, you know, we definitely work with children who have specific needs and build their mental health. Um, but we also work to build the mental health overall of the whole school community and offering some support. Um, and so each month we do have a focus of a trait we hope to build. And then once a year, we have a special program that's called the I Am Stronger program. And we talk about I Am Stronger as being stronger in our words, in our minds, in our actions, and building in kindness, inclusion, um, and reducing instances of bullying. And we know, psychologically, we know that feeling included is a very, very basic need. And all um, humans of all ages really need to feel that sense of belonging, that sense of inclusion. But of course, as we know, growing up, um, there are different key points where this becomes even more important. And so that was our focus for the I Am Stronger campaign this year is that idea of inclusion. So it's something we've been doing in our schools, in our school program for maybe like four years. Mm -hmm. And and really the main goal, right, has been to um, encourage kindness and fight that ugly word that we often talk about called bullying and maybe just to educate on what bullying is and what it isn't. Um, Cause I think oftentimes in our schools, we find that to be a confusing topic, right? At times. Confusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so my background um, is as a guidance counselor prior to coming in to do this work as a registered mental health counselor intern. And, and so that's a word that's used a lot. Um, and there's very specific criteria for what actually counts as bullying. Um, and so that's that's definitely a piece of the program to make sure kids understand meanness is not okay, but it is different than bullying. And so yeah. we go into that. And then we also really equip the students, equip the teachers, equip the parents on what to do. Um, and so again, the focus this year was on inclusion, how to include people. A lot of times um, we look at what's different about people and that kind of stands out first. And so our goal this last week was to help kids to see what's the same. And ultimately, as counselors, we know this, um, there's a lot more that's similar about us than that is different. And so once we see those things, we can start to build relationships and friendships, or at the very least, just kindness and, and respect for each other. And so that was the focus. Yeah, I think so much in the practice, like, and I'm sure you find this too, is we find so many people that come in for individual work and, and like our, our clients from back to back to back can usually be talking about the same things, but feel like they're the only ones experiencing it. So in our schools, in our families, in our marriages, in our relationships with children, like we want to be able to normalize that everybody goes through a lot of these things or we're more, more similar than we are different at times. So yeah, awesome. absolutely. Um, all right, so when we talk about inclusion at school, can you give us a little bit more about that and maybe some resources or some stories that you've heard along the way? Yeah, you might have heard this. Um, I really liked this story and it caught my eye um, and it's been around in a number of different venues. Um, but I really liked the story of this teacher. Um, she was a fifth grade teacher. So in her fifth grade classroom, every Friday afternoon, she would have students go through a particular process. She would have them write down four, the names of four children that they'd like to sit with the next week. And they would know that she may be able to honor it. She may not. Um, and they also had to nominate one exceptional classroom citizen for that week. So they would do this every Friday afternoon. They kind of knew the routine um, and they would submit it privately to her and probably to the students. They maybe didn't fully understand it. They thought, oh, good. You know, we get to maybe pick someone to sit next to. Um, but really, it had a much more important purpose. And so when she would get all of those um, ballots submitted to her, 
she would look for patterns. And so it didn't much matter who they wanted to sit with, although of course she honored those if she could, but she was really looking to see who's not getting requested by anyone else, um, mm -hmm. who can't think of anyone to request. They're just not even socially connected enough to write down names, um, who never get noticed enough to be nominated as that exceptional citizen for the week. And even just changes that might shift one week to the next, who had a million friends last week and has none this week. And so she took these, spread them out every Friday afternoon, and she's really looking for that whole idea of inclusion and, and who's being excluded, who's lonely, who's picked on, who's outside of the social structure. And doing this every single week, um, she had a chance to really see the patterns, really see what was going on, and really get a pulse of what's going on in um, socially in those classrooms. And so the articles that talked about this talk about you know stopping future school shootings, um, but really, we know, of course, that's important, but really just having that feeling of being included, having a teacher who cares, having those relationships with an adult that's important in your life, um, and then her stepping in in a lot of different ways to make sure that the kids who weren't getting nominated, who were kind of on the outskirts, were included. And so I think teachers are a huge, huge, huge um, front line mm -hmm. of doing this. And that's one of the things that's so great about taking this program into the schools. Um, but a lot of us as parents, Parents, you know, want to be involved in, and want to know how do we check in with our kids on this? Um, you know, we're working, we're doing a lot of our things, and so we pick them up. How was your day? We get kind of short answers. Um, but I think that's the focus of uh, this particular webinar and this particular focus is to really figure out, well, what do we do? How do we do this? Um, what can we do to check in with our kids and see that they feel included? Yeah, I think, I think too, every time I hear you say that word included, it's like, I want to know that I'm valued, that I have purpose and meaning, and that I'm worth somebody wanting to be around, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think we can resonate with that as adults and as kids. Like, I want to know that you care enough to check in with me. I want to know that, like, people invite me to lunch. And I see that, like, in the workplace, in, in car line, at school. Like, uh, I think it's true of adults and kids. And mm -hmm. so, recognizing and I think as parents we all worry about is our kid like mm -hmm. feeling included and how do they value themselves and feel about themselves so what are some things that we can do to make sure um, that kids are feeling included or that they are the ones including people too yeah I think that's a really good point I think a lot of the things that we will talk about um, we're going to talk about some things from the kid perspective but you know this is a human universal need that we all have and adults need to feel this at, at their workplaces as well as kids feeling that at school. Um, so one of the things we came up with for the school environment is this kind of a short little mantra, choose to include. And I think that's a really useful, just short thing that we can have in our minds. Um, if your kid is the one that could be an includer, maybe your kid's doing okay, it's doing well socially. A lot of times when we when we do think of bullying and things like that, we look for the upstanders, the people who can stand up and um, help the situation and, and be a positive influence in the situation. And so choose to include is a good way to do that. Some of the schools that we uh, work with have um, a, what they call a buddy bench. And the idea of the buddy yeah. bench is that a little bench. And if somebody sits on this bench, it's a kind of a sign that they want to be included. They want to play with somebody, but they just don't have someone to play with. Um, and I like the idea there. And really this um, idea is helping our kids learn how to include people, learn to look for how to do that, and really look for developing empathy. All of us can, can resonate with that idea of feeling excluded in some way. And so even as I went into classrooms last week and got to talk to kids, you know, everyone raises their hand when you ask, have you ever felt excluded? Adults would do the same. Um, and so that's, you know, a quick little mantra, choose to include to help kids kind of focus on including others. But I think it's an important mantra for families too, mm -hmm. building that connection, building that support. Um, like you heard, I've got kids who span from age eight now um, up to 19. And so that can be a challenge for those of you who have family members who are very different ages, very different abilities, very different um, connections. Uh, you know, I always kind of think having multiple kids is wonderful, but have one kid doesn't always prepare you for the next. They're really different. And so you might have some kids who are really socially connected and some who might be a little bit more um, preferring solitary time. And so that can be a struggle in families. And so I think this just quick mantra, choose to include and just 
having that as a focus, again, having what's more similar about us um, as a focus can be really helpful. I think too, like you were just it, like in my family, I have the outspoken child, like the super mm-hmm. outspoken child and then the very quieter child. And so when I think of choose to include, it's how am I making sure I've heard everybody's opinion, right? And how does sometimes I, how do I sometimes help my very outspoken child to be quieter and be able to listen to my quieter child and respect that like we have to give to people different time frames to respond to us, um, but that everybody's opinion is important. Like I hate going out to eat because nobody ever can choose the same spot, right? It's like <laughs> we all want to go to a thousand different places, but taking the time to hear where they want to go, even if you're not going to go there, is still an inclusion process. It's still telling them like your opinion is important to me and I want to hear what you have to say. So I think even in those little tiny things, we can include every member of our family. I love that point because I think sometimes we think to include someone, we have to go with what their idea was. Right. And, you know, as parents, we can't always go with what the kids' ideas are. But as we'll get to in a little bit, I think that piece of listening, and some Mm -hmm. of you had brought that up as a goal you guys had for your families, just just feeling listened to, just feeling valued, just feeling, wow, I was even asked about what I thought about this or what I wanted. Um, really speaks volumes and and is really important. So I think it's true in marriage too. Mm -hmm. Like I may not think that something I'm doing at work is even relatable to my husband, but to value, to include him in maybe like my thought processes or want to seek his opinion for things. I think that validates our spouses too of like, you're important to me and I care about your opinion. I might not agree with your opinion, but I'm going to listen to your perspective because you being different from me brings value to the conversation. So I just think that it can be applicable in so many, so many settings that we choose to include people. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, especially as adults, we're busy. We don't maybe take the time to say, here's how my day was. How was your day, honey? And and Mm -hmm. kind of connect in those ways, but they are important. And even if, and I'll share kind of a fun example Um, when we went into the classrooms, we had the kids talk about two very different items and their challenge was to find as many things that are similar about them as possible. And so I'll, I'll kind of describe what I brought. I brought a little figment doll, um, which was a stuffed animal. And then I brought a little model rocket. And so you look at them, they're very different in material. They're very different. And the kids came up with 20 or more things that were the same about them. And so I think in that way, you know, we might say what I do is totally different than what my spouse does. But something that I share, you know, my spouse might connect with and say, oh, wow, you know, I had a similar experience, even if it's in a very different way. Some of those feelings are the same. And so there's similarities that we don't even know. Right. And once we kind of get into that talking and listening perspective, you know, those kind of emerge. And so making it's sense huge. of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as we think about kids, though, um, it's it's important to think about their developmental level and how inclusion and helping them feel included will go. So preschool children, um, they're learning to do so many things, and they are really learning by social modeling. And so you might find that um, as you try to ask things and, and um, make some space for conversations, they're going to probably say something that somebody else has already said. And that's okay. Again, that just making mm-hmm. that space for them to feel included, that they got to share an opinion or be part of something um, is really important. As we move to elementary age, they're developing a lot of new skills, a lot of new abilities. And so ways to include them might be to highlight that. This is a really good time um, where a lot of kids start doing activities. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's performing arts, maybe it's um, some other creative outlet. They're interested in science. They're really reading. So they're developing those abilities, their ways of learning about the world um, and taking an interest in that and including some of those things um, that they're interested in can be really helpful. It could be something as simple as at the dinner table, you know, what's something that's really Um, that you learned today about animals. I know um, one of my kids is really into different animals. And so can you share a fact about those animals? So kind of thinking about them developmentally helps us to find ways to include them. So we get into the tween kind of time, that time between that younger child and they're not quite an adolescent yet. Um, And and it's important at these times to remember that kids in their tweens are forming their identity based on the groups that they're included in and those that they're excluded from. So when I go to middle school campuses and kind of talk about the social structure, it's very common that kids are joining new kinds of groups. I'm into 
this particular activity or this particular type of book, this particular type of movie. So things kind of, um, they, they begin to develop this, I'm part of this group, I'm part of that group. And so being excluded at that age can feel really difficult. And again, that just knowing I'm not alone is huge. Um, there's other kids like me. The great thing um, is that used well, the internet is a great way of getting kids to connect to other kids who are um, who are interested in similar things, whether finding meetups or finding other opportunities they can be part of. Um, and so, you know, kind of honing in to those things that they are becoming interested in and the, I, the groups they want to be part of and knowing that kind of forms their identity. And then as we get to teenagers, really their goal, and it's hard for us to have teenagers, um, but they're really their goal is to separate families. They are forming their own identity and it peers matter much more than their family at that point in terms of inclusion and forming their identity. And so of course they still um, have those basic principles from their families, but we start to see them spending more time with their peers They, as they begin to drive and can have some of those freedoms. Um, maybe they're working, they're really kind of out in the world. And so feeling included there um, is really important and important for us to kind of touch base on because we won't be as involved. As our kids are really little, we talk to their, their teachers, their teachers send home daily sheets when they're really little, even elementary school teachers are emailing, here's how things go. And that really dwindles in middle and high school um, and college and yeah. beyond. And, and that's hard for some parents. Um, and so well, and we want life. them. Like we, mm -hmm. I want my kids to be more <laughs> independent. That's my long-term goal in life is yeah. to launch and be out. And so, yeah, making sure that we are allowing them to be able to do that, I think is a key piece in parenthood. I think that's hard too, because we know that's the end goal, but then day to day, you know, we, we, mm -hmm. it's hard to respect their privacy or that they don't want to share everything with us. Like maybe they did when they were little. Um, but yeah, keeping that end goal, eventually I want them to launch and do that right. successfully and feel okay in the world. Um, that that mm -hmm. is our end goal. <laughs> <laughs> so it's helpful to remember for sure. Awesome. Well, as we're moving on here too, um, let's talk about an acronym, acronym that we like to use a lot. Um, or a lot, I don't know if a lot is the right word, but let's talk about an acronym that... Um, we use a lot in some different settings and it's called ears for fear. So you want to, you want to tell us a little bit more about that because I think it applies to some of the questions that we were, that we were getting on our registration. Yeah. If people were registering, one of the themes that we saw is that um, a lot of you guys were really wondering, wondering how to improve listening. Um, some things about decreasing attitude um, in kids and really making it a more receptive environment. And I love this. Um, so this idea of ears for fears is especially useful when your kids have something they're afraid of, something that's worrying them, something that's troubling them. Um, like we talked about before, bullying would be a really good example, but really anything, anything that um, that is kind of on their minds. And so the E-A-R-S stands for earnestly listen accept the child's story, reassure, and then suggestions. And so we'll go through each one of those a little bit more. Um, I think that earnestly listen piece that came up a lot as you guys were registering and sharing what you hope uh, to build in your families. And, and a lot of times, you know, we, we're not really, as counselors, we're trained in listening, um, but overall the general population isn't. And most of the time mm -hmm. when someone's speaking, we're thinking in our minds what we're going to say next. We're not fully engaging. We're, you know, not fully listening. We're not attuning to everything that's happening. So I really kind of encourage parents when you're earnestly listening, do that without any other distractions, devices go away, eye contact, proximity, all of those things um, really help to earnestly listen. And I encourage parents a lot of times to just take a quick breath before they respond. So yeah. just for a second, as you hear your child say something, you know, listen, nod, do all of those things, and then take a quick breath before you say. And it just gives a little bit of space to know that they're finished and to really feel, again, what Megan is talking about, that validation that I'm being heard, I'm really being understood. I think this can be said uh, for spouses, uh, right? Because <laughs> so much it's, um, I want to prove my point and you want to prove your point. So I don't listen to your point because I'm, I'm preparing my argument because I'm going to be right. And so it needs to be that piece where 
if we're really working to validate each other, that we are almost like removing all the internal distractions too, not just the physical distractions, although this thing can be super (laughs) distracting, um, but really like putting the vices down and working to honestly hear their perspective, even if we don't agree with it. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, I think, and the next one gets to that a little bit. Again, this is with children, but it totally works with spouses. Accept the child's story, even if the story doesn't make any sense. And so that's true. A lot of times, as parents or spouses, we want to jump in and say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Um, but if we're really listening earnestly, we're going to accept what's presented, you know, for whatever reason. A lot of times as parents um, and as adults, we don't really understand a child's perspective because to mm-hmm. us, these things would not be scary. We wouldn't have fear about it. We would handle it a different way. Right. And so understanding, okay, I might handle the situation a different way. Um, doesn't need to take away from this is how my child in this second is handling it. It might be once they have a chance to share it, they'll come to a different place. Um, but the, whatever we can do to really accept their version of the story really helps them to feel heard and validated. Uh, and honestly, whether it's with your children or your spouses, if they feel heard and validated, they'll come to you more often. So if you're in a situation where your yeah. kid doesn't open up, I think those two steps alone help make that feel like a safer place to do that. I think it's easier to hear like you tell me something about your situation with somebody else and how you felt in that situation rather than like you tell me something about how you felt about our interaction Mm -hmm. and where it wasn't my intent for you to feel that way, but you felt that way. It would be easy for me to be like, you're wrong. I totally didn't say it like that. Like I have that in my office all the time. Like that's not what I said. Those were not the words. But that's how you interpreted it. And in some way, I have to own the fact that that's how you heard my words. And there's a piece of that on me and there's a piece of that on you. But to just totally negate what they're feeling right off the bat does not allow you to listen to anybody. Um, And that's really what that piece of that accept is, is like hear it for what they're saying and understand it from their perspective, um, even if it involves you not how you meant it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we can understand from someone else's perspective and disagree at the same time. Most definitely. And that, and that's, I think really important for us to remember in those moments, because in those moments, maybe our knee jerk reaction is to disagree, but yeah, pushing through is really important. And then the next step, especially for kids is that reassure step. Kids need to know that you take them seriously and that you will be there and that you will help them handle it. Or if it, if you need to step in and handle it, that you will do that. And that reassurance, especially when they're talking about something that um, is fearful for them or scary in some way, or is just a big thing, that reassurance is helpful. And it can be anything like, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Mm -hmm. Um, But just reassuring them that, yes, I've heard you. I've taken this seriously. I understand where you're coming from. and, And then giving them that reassurance. I think in relationships that helps to build safety. And I often share with the couples that I see too of like, you know, when you want to go and talk to your spouse and you're like, um, this might sound crazy, but (laughs) if you feel like you can share with your spouse, a this might sound crazy, but then you have safety because that person is not going to tell you that you're crazy, but they're going to hear you out. And so We need to create an environment in our relationships where we can share the crazy things um, that come in our head because we have that safety and because that other person listens and reassures us that they're not going anywhere, even if we sound crazy. And I think that in, in your relationship with your children and in your relationship with spouses, our friends needs to be so present. Like I'm not leaving, even though you just told me the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life, I'm still going to be here. I love that. And that makes me chuckle because in my relationship, it's okay, hear me out. Right. (laughs) So whatever it is in your relationship, whatever that tagline is, like you need to have that. Yeah. The rest of what comes out of my mouth, just hold on. We're going to get there. But it is that, yeah, I know that we're going to get there. I know that this is a safe place. And that's the final suggestion or the final step here. Suggest that children may consider various solution options and have support and encouragement in the attempt to resolve the issue. And so this for children specifically has to do totally with wherever they are developmentally. Um, preschoolers are going to need a lot more guidance from us. Um, middle schoolers, we might, and high schoolers, we might be a little bit more of, okay, what are your ideas? 
And then maybe we'll suggest a few and, and kind of guide their decision making process. But getting them to having have some kind of solution, some kind of options um, is kind of that final step of building that connection. Yeah. And I, I, I love that because like in my relationship with my husband, who I love dearly and I talk about all the time, but it's like, so your idea didn't work. Are you ready to try mine? <laughs> like I sat with you while you went off on your ridiculous tangent and I supported you and I waited to see how it was going to work out, but it totally didn't work. So will you try my <laughs> idea now? But it's like, I'm going to continue to support you through that process of finding resolution. And so often people feel like they'll be abandoned. Or, or I think what happens more and more in our culture is a parent swoops in and tries to resolve it for them. And so we aren't doing the suggesting piece. We're doing the taking over piece. Um, and man, you, your kid will miss out on a vital piece in their life that they need. If you continue to swoop in and have the conversation with the teacher, instead of putting your kid to have the conversation with the teacher. So more and more in the ears to fears, it's about listening, accepting, um, reassuring, suggesting, and all of that to me is empowerment. Like we are just trying to empower our kids that we value them and we think that they are able to handle their problems themselves and we'll walk with them, but we're not going to take over and That's handle it hard. for them. I know because I want to so all the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah, especially those middle and high schoolers where we're like, oh, just a quick email to the teacher, yeah. you know, but yeah. Yeah, it's super hard and we need to equip it. We need to figure out a way, yeah, to do it better at times. All right, so moving along here, um, this is, I know, this is the book you and I adore. Um, and we're going to share this resource with you and a link for it. Okay, I'm just going to pause for a second because this camera is driving me nuts. So I'm trying to focus on the person who's talking, but we're going to figure this thing out. Um, so yeah, tell us about Dan Siegel's work and we're going to share some resources at the end, but tell us about, especially on this slide. Yeah. And so, yeah, Dan Siegel has written a lot of books. Megan and I love most of them and have read most of them. I'm sure we would love all of them. We're working through his stack of books. Um, but I love this and he likes a lot of alliteration. So he calls this the four S's. People always want to be seen, safe, soothed, and secure. And so we're talking about kids, but of course, we're also talking about any relationships, spousal relationships, any relationship that's important all across all family relationships. We want to be seen, safe, soothed and secure. And some of these came up in the last slide as well. Um, but I like some of the ways that he talks about them as well. And so this idea of being seen and it's not just seeing with the eyes and it's it's really understanding who the other person is. So perceiving them deeply empathetically. And again, that idea of empathy is that we understand what it's like from their perspective. It may not be how we would handle it or how we would respond to a situation, but we understand what it's like from their perspective, the child's perspective, the spouse's perspective, um, and, and kind of building that empathy. And so he has this idea of mindsight and, and has written another book on that, which we also love. Um, and, it, and it's really vital to mental health and to feeling valued and to feeling included and to feeling secure. Um, and so some of those things come up. And so these are kind of those core things that need to be there. Um, safety, of course, uh, we avoid actions and responses that frighten or hurt us. And so in conversations, one of the things as counselors, you know, we talk about if you're responding in a way to your loved one that does not make them want to come back and talk to you, then that's a huge barrier. Um, and so mm -hmm. doing the listening, doing those things we talked about on the last slide, doing the validating, making space for how they view it is really important. And so definitely physical safety, um, but emotional safety, really kind of making sure that we are caring for the people around us. A lot of you guys might have heard of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That safety is, we can't really do anything else if we're not safe. And so to have safety in our families is hugely, hugely, hugely important. Yeah, I would, I think too, like, as we talked about, like in relationships and stuff, it's so important. And it, all three of these, um, safety, uh, being safe, being soothed and secure, there's just such a need in me for boundaries all the time, um, is that you're teaching these, like you're helping them feel that way you're not doing it for them. Right. And there's such a fine line um, in those things. So 
helping them soothe themselves so that they can soothe themselves too, right? Like having that ability to be doing that. But I think that the safety and security that we talk about in relationships and marriage, um, Gary Smalley has a book that I want to share with you guys about that. And it's just all about how that leads to intimacy, like how that leads to connection um, in spouses and in marriage, but also a connection with your child, right? Mm -hmm. That they feel heard and and known by you. And so, um, man, that connects to our spiritual life too. Like we, I honestly believe God knows me and hears me and soothes me and keeps me safe and is my security. And so being the hands and feet of Jesus, like being able to do that in relationships is so important. Yeah. And I think as you say that, I think it feeling safe to be who you authentically are is huge. Um, and that's kind of the piece. If, if it's okay for me to really be me and be imperfect and, you know, have that kind of relationship in my family, I don't always have to be perfect. That comes up so often in the mm-hmm. work we do as counselors. Um, so I think having that safety to be yourself and, and that the self is evolving and that's, you know, we have that from God, we know we're accepted. Um, and, and human relationships sometimes fall short of that, but I think it's definitely a goal to really, uh, build those connections. And then again, yeah, that soothing piece, um, you know, even as little, little babies, we try to give them some tools to start to soothe themselves. And then definitely as our, as our children age that they hopefully can come to us if they need some support. But again, we're, we're part of it but they also have some other tools and resources to soothe themselves, to get through difficult situations. Um, a lot of times I'll end up reading books to kids in classrooms of things with titles like I can handle this, you know, helping yeah. them to know um, that's a great book of, you know, I can do this. And and, I'll, and a lot of times I'll have kids say, I can do hard things. And that's, you know, uh, there's a big talk now. Where everyone's like, I'm adulting. And really that means I'm doing hard things. I'm getting up. I'm doing the things I need to do. The things that nobody wants to do. That's what we're doing. Yeah, <laughs> we need to do the things that we don't want to do. Um, yeah, and so knowing we can do that. And then feeling secure. Uh, when we know kind of what's expected of us and that it's okay to be authentic in who we are. Um, and hopefully our families are that place where we feel secure. We feel like this is for real. This is forever. Like Megan is talking about in couples, that's huge that, that we can kind of bring whatever our catchphrase is. Okay. Hear me out. Um, I know I feel secure in this. I can share whatever crazy thing I need to share now. And I know we're going to get, get through there. It. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think that, um, too, I just want to pause for a second. And as you guys have questions, please feel like you can um, populate those in there for us. We will have a question section in a little bit. And only one person responded with who they are and who lives in their house. So I'm a little worried that maybe it's not working quite as well as we want it to. So I believe on the right hand side is where it says questions that you can put something in there. Um, Okay, so as we move forward after Dan Siegel's Oops, um, feeling seen, safe, soothed, and heard. Um, just some ideas, um, some hands-on tools of how you can have family members feel included um, in your family. So I'm going to try to go back to this where it auto-focuses. Technology and me are having mm-hmm. a fight today. Well, so it could be something as simple as doing something together and finding a role for every member of the family. So that could be making dinner. That's great. Even little, little ones can put a napkin on a table. Um, or even littler ones who are even littler that can just hold something, hold a spoon. Your job is to hold a spoon and then that little baby can feel included. Um, on up to maybe older kids could, could take part in preparing some of the meal. And so doing some kind of an activity where um, everybody has a really important role in the activity and then even talking about it. Uh, in my family, I, I like to reward that process. So eating the meal might be a reward. Um, it might be, hey, we're all cleaning up the living room. Everybody has a part in that process. Um, and then we all sit down and watch either a funny show or play a board game together. Um, and we can kind of talk about that. Gosh, everybody really pitched in. We're all part of this family and kind of those themes of inclusion, I think, are important. I also love, and this is an activity, this next one that we did in the, in the schools, and it was completing a puzzle. And again, like I said, when we start looking at what makes us similar to each other instead of what makes us different, um, we, we really learn and grow in a lot of ways. And so a puzzle is a really great way to do that. Uh, if two people are holding a puzzle piece and as they put it together, they talk about what's similar about themselves, about each of those two people, then that can be really fun. And then as the next person puts their puzzle piece in, how are they similar to the person whose puzzle piece that was? 
Um, and so especially I'd say as uh, kids are entering, again, those middle school years, those high school years where their identity starts to be different. They start to feel so different than their parents. I'm nothing like you. And, you know, secretly we kind of know, gosh, you, you are exactly like me. Like me. <laughs> I walked this walk. Um, but it, but it's a great way that's not uh, threatening, not intrusive for them to say, okay, you know, and uh, I guess we do both have a temper or I guess we both really do like crafting things. You just like it in that way. And I like it in this way. So we can start to see those similarities. Um, so I think those can be some fun ways to do it. I also think just some simple ways to check in on how your kids are doing. Uh, a lot of times I'll use scaling questions from one to 10, what number was today? 10 is the best day it could have been, one is the worst day it could have been. And that could just be a quick, easy way. Uh, kids who don't maybe wanna share a lot about their day, they could give you a number of oh, today's a five, and then you'll kind of see trends over. Um, today's an eight. And if they will engage, you could say, oh wow, what made it an eight? Or gosh, a five is kind of lower for you. Um, I think it's important to know when to ask that, like too, mm -hmm. because, like, I have a son who's very introverted, and when he gets home, like, he needs nobody to talk to him because people have been talking to him all day. And yeah. so he's better around, like, the 8 o'clock time frame of where he, like, slowly creeps down when nobody's down there, and then we start talking about his day. And if I can be patient enough to wait for him to get his needs met and then talk with him, th then I have much more. Where then, like, my girls are, like, blah, 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 all day long, right? <laughs> um, so it's, it is about knowing your kid and then respecting what they need in the time. I love well. that. Yeah, because I think a lot of times parents, it's, like, the pickup or right when we all get home. Right. And a lot of us just need a break. I would – and the conversation would go better. We'd do all of those things. We wouldn't have a device. We'd listen earnestly. We'd do all of those things if we just found the right timing. Yeah. So I think – and knowing that that may differ for kids. It and, does. And, it differs for and, adults, and, too, and, yeah. right? <laughs> I tell the story when my husband and I first got married, I would invite people over like after work and he'd be like, oh my gosh, why are you, I've been with people all day. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a very extroverted person and I get energized by being around people and he doesn't. And so I had to learn to like respect that he needed that time. Um, and so I couldn't just invite anybody over after, after work and he needed time to be down and process. And so it's about finding those balances and people in our life and what they need um, to function properly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then I think another, um, another quick strategy for maybe the kid who doesn't, you know, you get the one word answer. Sometimes a fill in the blank or, or kind of complete the sentence can be helpful of the most surprising thing about today was, um, and I would say grownups have to answer that question too. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we expect our kids to share about their day, but we don't. Um, and so I think to really be inclusive, we, we can all answer those questions. The best thing about today, the most surprising thing, a disappointing And be thing. honest, right? Like mm -hmm. we so much only want to tell our kids the good things. And then if they are having a horrible day, it's like, oh, you can't because mom never has a horrible day. Like, you, I, I mean, transparency and honesty, I think is the best in our kids and to teach that, you know, other people's lives are difficult too. Yeah. And it really models like, it's okay. Like I've definitely done that where I've been like, well, I made a mistake in something at work and then I felt really bad and here's how I got out of that. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, then they, it gives them permission to share the same thing. Like, oh gosh, I made a mistake on my spelling test or I totally failed a chemistry exam, you know, and it, so it kind of creates space for that. Yeah. And how can we do it differently next time? All right. What about some tools for couples? Yeah. And so I think this one's kind of interesting and just as a point to ponder, um, just what do you guess is the ideal ratio of positive to negative interactions in a flourishing marriage relationship? Um, so it could be one positive thing to every negative, three positives to every negative, five positives to every negative, seven, nine, and, and just to something to think about in your mind and we'll kind of let you know. Um, if you can type into the chat box, you're welcome to do that. I'm not sure if people are able to. I think it's the question box. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, question. yeah. Box. Um, yeah. so if you want to share that and like kind of what we're talking about is like how I think often our perspectives on spouses and couples and just what we think is needed is skewed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and how does that how does that balance out? And like you were talking about, there's a lot of there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of things to read about couples and just to understand our dynamics. But a lot of it is pretty relatable to relationships in general in life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And so 
Um, so some said, most of them said five. Okay. We had two answers. So five positives for every negative. So what is our answer, uh -huh. Miss Erica? Well, yeah, absolutely. So that is actually the answer. So five um, is ideal for marriage relationships. Um, three is good for uh, kind of workplace relationships, could go up to six. Um, but yeah, if you think about that, if something negative has happened, there's been some kind of a negative interaction, then you've got to do five things to reconnect. And so sometimes, you know, as Valentine's is coming up, we kind of think about that. Okay, well, I've said that I'm sorry. I've done the flowers thing. I brought the chocolate. That's <laughs> only three. <laughs> so just kind of remembering that, yeah, to keep that ratio and it's ratio overall um, of positives to negatives. But interestingly, the research is pretty clear that too many positives, kind of like Megan was saying, too many positives isn't a good thing either because it starts to feel that you're not authentic. Nobody has 11 right. positives or 15 positives to every negative, you know, because um, there are going to be things. We're going to disagree. We're going to have some conflict. And so they've actually done some research about that. You stop being believable as you get into the teens um, of positives to negatives. <laughs> um, and so, but that's really a good thing to consider um, is that three to six positive interactions for each negative. Um, again, a lot of the research is on couples, but for for parent and child react, uh, relationships and interactions, I think it's really important too, is to consider that. Uh, as parents, a lot of times our goal in parenting is to kind of correct and kind of get them on the right path. But if you look and you think about, let's say the last 24 hours, last yeah. couple of days, how many times have I said something my kid would perceive as negative and how many times have I balanced that out with a positive? And, and that, I think, is a huge challenge to parents. And all too often, like what we perceive, sarcasm is not always qualified as a positive. Correct. Right? <laughs> That's true. We would have to say, like, in general. And so, especially with kids who can misinterpret our meaning. Um, but also with our spouses. Like, I grew up in a home that was a very sarcastic. And, um... And, and it was received well sometimes and not always. So I think you have to be careful of counting sarcasm as a positive, yeah. as I know from experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And so kind of, you know, thinking about that, I think it's a really good reminder of just checking, checking in every once in a while. You know, as you think about, do we all feel included? Are we all feeling positive? And especially in families where there are multiple relationships, you know, it's not just a couple um, where there's kids, there's a lot of dynamics as you start to draw that out, you see there's relationships between each individual mm -hmm. member and each other individual member. Um, what are, are they getting off task a little bit, you know, maybe one kid is getting a kind of a skewed negative Lozado ratio. That's kind of the technical name for this. Um, and another kid is having a lot more positives to every negative. And so I think as a parent, as a spouse, um, as anybody in any relationship, just doing kind of a gut check on those things. And then also um, just to kind of notice on the research that they've done, this is Dr. Gottman, um, who's a very well-renowned marriage and family um, expert really, has done tons and tons, decades and decades of research on this. Uh, the, re the ratio for couples who tend to get divorced or separate is 0.8 positives to each negative. And so that's only slightly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of a, a, a big crazy. shocker for a lot of people. That's only slightly more negative than positive. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know this as we work with couples in our counseling offices here at LCS, a lot of times people, you know, have been in a really negative state for a long time when they come in. And so I think it's really yeah. for all of us, it's a good time to just check in what's that ratio and how can we make it more positive in a genuine, authentic way with that earnest listening and all those things we talked about. And in a way, like I shared, uh, we're, like our focus this, this month is definitely love um, and and how, how where is love in your story um, with your children, with your spouses. But one thing I shared at the beginning of the month, and if you want to go to our website and um, read it, was a blog about understanding your love language. Mm -hmm. um, and not just your love language, your child's love language. Because sometimes those positives where you think you're showing love to somebody else, they don't always see it as love. And they interpret it differently. And so to really know what your spouse, what your child, what your friend, 
um, how they receive love in a way that makes them feel love, like that's critical. Um, so I'd encourage you, if this is something you want to dive into more, um, to taking that love language test. It's a very simple like little quiz online. There's five different love languages and it really might just open up your mind, mm -hmm. especially with your children, um, about how they perceive love and when they feel loved. So That's huge. Yeah. I can think of times for me, I'm um, acts of service. And so I do a lot of acts of service to my kids and not all of them take that as love. They're right. Like, oh, thanks mom. But for me, when they do something for me, that to me communicates love. But for some of them, it's, I need to do it a different way. So mm -hmm. I'm working really hard and it's not communicating the love that I think it is. Yeah. But like it's a lot of frustration for me. I have a sensory issue. And so I, I hate being touched. Like I just don't like being touched. And of course, my <laughs> husband's love language is, you know, touch, physical, physical touch. touch. Yeah. And so he tries to show it to me in that way. And like, for me, really, it doesn't do that. Like, it's not my love language. And so then it's hard for me to think about doing that for other people. So just knowing what is your, and you can have more than one love language, but you usually have one that you are not like that you totally mm -hmm. are not. And it's that so interesting that, yep. when you marry somebody who that is their love. Language. And so. usually I feel you do. I know, right? It usually works that way. That God has a funny sense of humor. Um, uh, as we talked about, and we already talked about a couple of these things, um, we're going to be winding up in a couple minutes. So if you have some questions that you really want us to answer that you didn't get answered, please put them in the question box because we want to be able to address those questions, um, for you. Um, but one thing that, um, I know we've talked about a lot for couples is using I statements. Um, and I remember my premarital counseling, my husband and I always talk about this and she was like, you need to use I statements. And I remember getting in an argument and like, all right, we're going to use I statements. And like, you can't say what you want to say right away. Like it slows the conversation down to almost a frustrating point, but it makes your words more intentional. And so challenging yourself, um, even with your kids to use I statements, or I often challenge my kids when they're in an argument with their sibling to use an I statement. Um, and it, and it, it's like, mind boggling and frustrating. <laughs> and how do I say this? And, um, but it's a really good tool in any relationship to work past some conflict, to be able to reframe yourself in that way. Yeah. I think that's true. Cause blame is kind of what wants to come out first. Yeah. Like we take a step back and do the I statement or a judgment wants to come out first. And so instead of doing that, we do descriptions of the, this is what happened and kind of talk about it more removed instead of like, I'm judging you and blaming you for everything. It would be better, much better if we did it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you guys have questions, please feel like you can post them. Um, we want to be able to answer them um, and address any needs that are coming up um, for you. I know in registration, um, we asked you to answer some questions, and it was a lot to do with um, uh, feeling listened to, uh, a little bit to do with attitudes. Um, and... What I would have to say about attitude in children, I and this is me telling myself, this is me, the therapist, telling me, the mother, this, is that it is a stage you have to go through of children to learn how to present themselves in different situations and how to be aware of their tone of voice, be aware of their facial expressions. And so if, and this sounds, I hate it when I say it, but your child uses you as that experimental place mm -hmm. to test those things out. And they do that because you are their safe place. And there are many times in my life where I wish I was not her safe place. <laughs> um, but know that that is part of life. That is a stage of development and that your child uses you as that environmental setting to test out those things and that you have a chance to grow your child through that. It does not mean the attitude disappears. It does not mean it goes away in a moment, but it does mean that you can reflect back to them what they're doing and what they need to change. So then when they're out in the real world, they don't get gobbled up in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think like we said, it, it, the four S is being that secure place for them, helping them feel safe. Yeah, we are sometimes the, the trial period um, for them to kind of develop some of those skills. And I always try to remind myself again, <laughs> the counselor talking to the mom, um, that 
I want to share my calm with them. Sometimes things get elevated really quickly. Um, and so I want to be the place where I can share my calm with them and then kind of hold that space for them um, as they're upset about something and do the best I can to say I statements, um, try to help them know I'm under trying to understand what, where they're coming from and then try to keep it going well. Um, but a lot of times kids and, and adults as well, um, will kind of escalate really quickly. And so I try to think of like, keep my calm, share my calm with, mm -hmm. with whether it's my spouse or um, kids and that kind of helps. So we did get a question and it's interesting. I had this question in my office the other day. So the question says, um, with regards to love languages, is it possible that we choose our love language based on what we don't get enough of? She said, my child gets enough affection and acts of service but she's not getting a lot of gifts from me. So wishes that I bought her more stuff. Now, I'm not going to say I'm the expert. There's a whole book called The Five Love Languages, but I don't believe that to be true. I believe that we do kind of have an innate piece in us about what our love language is. Um, and it's, it, it's funny, in my office recently, people have characterized that um, gift giving or gift getting, receiving of gifts love language as um, a negative love language. And I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't say that it's a negative piece. Um, I, I do get that for some people, it makes um, people present as maybe greedy. Um, I do believe there might, there may be a correlation if as a child, um, positive words weren't spoken to you, positive affirmations, you might seek those out more. Um, but to my knowledge and what I've read about the five love languages is it's not based on the child, how you were brought up. Um, and, and I could be wrong, but that, that's just my honest belief. Um, and and I would challenge you that if, if your child's gift or if your child's love language is gifts, it doesn't mean it has to be brand new, expensive Correct. things, right? It could be gifting them a piece of jewelry that's yours that you're sharing with them. Like it, it, it's about receiving. It's really about being thought about that you took the time to give them something. So yes. it's not about the value of it. Mm -hmm. It's not about how brand new it is. Um, and so if that's what they're more focused on, that probably is not their love language. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on no, that? Erica? I have a lot of thoughts <laughs> as you're talking too. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if they're saying my love language is I need the new iPhone 11. <laughs> they, That's a very specific. Yes. Um, because I, I have had, this is, <laughs> this is a conversation that has come up in a lot of different ways, professionally and personally. Um, so I think, I think I would go back to developmentally at certain stages of life. It is really hard to not have whatever that thing is. And I'll share myself. Keds were the shoes that were a really big deal. I did <laughs> not have kids. I remember this many, many decades it's later. It's traumatic. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say some of it is that. I think yeah. Knowing where your kid is developmentally um, and knowing if that, it, and and then I think that's a piece of it. It is hard to feel excluded. Everybody else in the, like mom, everybody in the else in the class has a cell phone, has, is allowed to play yeah. this game, can watch YouTube. Um, You know, I think some of that is feeling excluded, but the true love language isn't specific about the gift. It means that, yeah, getting something small that is theirs, that was intentional, that was thought out for them, um, communicates love to them. That's what it means. So I would, I guess I would kind of challenge that and need to know a little bit more, but those would be the things to think about. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for the question. That was a really yeah. great question. And honestly, you're not the only one asking that. I hope you hear. I literally had two sessions in the last week about right. that. So. All right. So I want to teach you really quick a check-in um, procedure um, that we are, are highlighting as our practice of the month. And then Erica and I want to share some more resources with you, books, if you like books, um, and just some pieces that maybe can help you grow in this area. But as you have more questions, post them. We have just about like five or eight more minutes with you. So I wanna get to this. So this month we are teaching the healthy practice. It's called a five finger check-in. Um, so it's something you could do with your kids at night, with your spouse during the day, um, maybe even with your like accountability partner. Um, so the first thing you do is you share your highs and lows with each other. And then you read a portion of scripture together and then you talk about how that scripture applies to your highs and lows. You pray for each other and then you bless each other. So super easy. Share, read, talk, pray, and bless. 
Now I say super easy and it may not always be that easy, right? To share some of those personal things. So here's what I'll challenge you. Um, highs and lows. One good thing that happened today, one bad thing. Everybody in the room shares it. A piece of scripture. Maybe it's something, a scripture verse you've memorized. Maybe it's not scripture. Maybe it's an inspiring story. Or like the story that we saw on the news of the boys, that one boy raised all that money and paid off everybody's lunches. And how would that apply to your highs and lows for the day? I encourage you to pray together. We believe that where the Holy Spirit gathers, um, that two people gather in his name, that he's present. And that could be as simple as praying a prayer that you memorized, right? It does not have to be this elaborate prayer. And then to bless each other. And honestly, to bless each other just to means just means to remind each other uh, that they are worthy and valued. So that could simply be like just turning to Erica and say, I value you. You are an important child of God. Like, that's it. So it's a super easy check in you can do with your spouse, with your kid. Um, like I said, with your accountability partner. It works to create that safety and security and to soothe each other by listening to each other. Um, so that's a simple thing that you can do um, with your family members, with your friends, um, anybody who you're working to have a deeper relationship with. Um, we have a couple of resources that we definitely wanted to share with you. I'm going to click over to this one more slide because we had some on there. Um, so we talked about these two books. I'm going to show you. This one is Mindsight. Um, this is by Dan Siegel. I would tell you that this is a difficult book to read. It is like not an easy read, but if you're really into this whole piece of mindsight or how the brain works and stuff, um, it's a good book. He's not a Christian author, but he has some Christian concepts in here, I'm just going to say. But the book that we highly recommend to parents, and it is super easy to read, is called The Whole Brain Child. If you've been around LCS long enough, I'm sure you've heard about this from us. Um, super easy to read, even has pictures. Um, and I, I think it's just a really great book to talk about how to understand your child better and how to encourage them to use their brain. And then I'll share. Um, there we go. So this is uh, John Gottman's book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Super easy read, uh, very, very understandable, but he also goes into the research behind all of this stuff, how he came up with these principles. He does what he calls a love lab and really looks at couples of all kinds. Um, and, and it's a really great resource. And there's seven principles and he walks you through each of them. So it could be a good read for a couple to read together. It could be a good read for someone to read individually. Um, but you'll see a lot of the things we've talked about will show up here in, in how to relate to each other. A book I love and I share with a lot of couples that I see, and it has, I will tell you, just a um, a very intimidating, intimidating title. <laughs> it's called The Language of Sex by Gary Smalley, um, and it is about, honestly, about communication, safety, and security, and how that leads to intimacy. I love it. I think it's a great book. Um, we, I, I would, I tell a lot of couples like if you can't afford to get in counseling or it could be a first step before counseling, read it together. It has questions at the end of every chapter. Um, it really like it, it helps, it helped to work on my marriage. So I, I say it from not just a clini clinician, but from a spouse. Um, so, uh, one person also asked, uh, they were late to join us. Will this be posted? Yes. You should receive an email of a link to our recording. But I would encourage all of you, um, like us on Facebook, um, we are going to post links to these books, these resources, we will share our webinar, uh, and then you'll be notified about other webinars that we do have. So you will be able to watch this in full probably in like two hours, if that's helpful for you. We just want to be a helpful resource for you. So anything else to share, Erica, before we end? No, thank you so much for being here or watching this later. Um, we really, really hope that this impacts your relationships in such a positive way. Families, couples, all, all, all types of relationships. So thanks for being here. And I really hope I can get this silly <laughs> camera like to work how I want it to. Um, so yes, thanks so much for being here. We're going to do this once a month. Um, watch for our healthy practice of the month. Uh, of the month and then follow our blogs and social media on Facebook as we're going to share more resources with you. I pray you guys have a wonderful day and thanks so much for joining us.